Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to learn how to solve algebra word problems. Today we'll begin our lesson with problem number 51. Problem number 51, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. Let's take a look at it, shall we? We are told that P people. P people eat M candies each. They each eat M candies per hour. The question is, if that's the case, how long will 120 candies last? How long, the how is not a new sentence. How long, how long will 120 candies last? Let's see what we can do. So, P people, P people eat M candies each per hour. If each one of them is eating M candies, for example, for example, if you have three people eating two candies each, then they are eating six candies per hour. If you have ten people and each one of them is eating five candies, then five times ten people they will be eating fifty candies per hour. So P people eating M candies per hour means how much are they eating each hour? Well, let's find out. P people P people each eat M candies per hour. That tells us that implies that they are eating they eat P times M candies total per hour. So now we know how many candies we are consuming each hour. How many candies we have? We have 120 candies. If we divide the total number of candies by how many we are eating per hour, we should have the number of hours that the candies will last. So that tells us that 120 candies, therefore, therefore 120 candies should last, should last 120 over E times M hours. That's it. That's our answer. Last thing we need to do is verify our answer. And we always verify our answer by plugging in numbers for the variables, converting and thereby converting this algebraic problem into an arithmetic problem and making sure that the answer that we get arithmetically agrees with the answer that we got algebraically. But when you're doing that, it's always a good idea to plug in smart numbers, numbers that make our work, our life easier. We have 120 here, so let's plug in some numbers in such a way that it comes out to be 12, because it's a nice multiple of 12. So pick numbers. Are we going to have three people, three people each eating four candies? If we have three people each eating four candies per hour, then every hour they're going to eat 12 candies. If they're eating 12 candies every hour, and we have 120 candies, based on P equal to 3 and M equal to 4, we should get an answer of 10. We should get an answer of 10. Does that give us 10? Let's find, of course it gives us 10 because as you can see, P times N, P times M is 3 times 4, which is 12. 120 divided by 12. This is going to be 120 divided by P, which is 3 times 4, and 120 divided by 12, of course, is 10. That tells us that this answer is correct. Let's do the next one, shall we? The, simple, the verification here was very simple because it was a very simple problem. It's a very simple one-step problem. Number 52. Write down, write down five consecutive numbers, five consecutive numbers of which, of which L is the least. That's all. We have to write, we have to express five numbers algebraically, five, they have to be consecutive, such that the L represents the least of them. Let's do it, shall we? The consecutive numbers, they come right one after the other, three, four, five, so on and so forth. So first one, if the least one, least of them, smallest of them is L, what's going to be the next one? Well, if this L is the smallest one, L is the least one, the one after that is going to be one more than that. 
and one after that is going to be one more than that one. L plus one plus one is going to be L plus two, and one after that is going to be L plus three, and finally L plus four. There you go. We have just expressed five consecutive numbers from least to the greatest. Let's do the next one, shall we? Write down five consecutive numbers of which M is the middle one. How would you do this one? Of which M has to be the middle one. How would we write it down? In the language of algebra, how would we express these five consecutive numbers such that M represents the one in the middle? Since M represents the one in the middle, you're going to put right in the middle M. That's your middle number. The one after that is going to be one more than that because they're consecutive numbers. And one after that is going to be one more than the one previous, n plus 2. What about the one that comes before the middle number? The one that comes before is going to be one less than that, m minus 1. And the one that comes before that one is going to be m minus 2. There you go. That's the answer to our second problem. m is the middle number. Let's do one more, shall we? Write down five consecutive numbers of which of which G is the how do you spell greatest? Greatest. Oh Jesus. Greatest. Great. Greatest. There we go. G is the greatest. So now we do not start with the middle, we do not start with the least, we start with the greatest. G represents the greatest. And therefore we're going to go in the descending order. The one before that is going to be G minus 1. One before that is going to be G minus 2. One before that is going to be G minus 3. And the least one is going to be G minus 4. Voila. So here we have represented five consecutive numbers such that this quantity g represents the biggest one. g minus 4 is the smallest one. Here we have represented five consecutive numbers such that m represents the one in the middle. One before that we represented five consecutive numbers such that l represented the least of them. This by the way in my notation here, just so you're with me, I have represented that as 52, 53, and 54, problem number 54. We are up to problem number 55. I don't want you to wonder what happened to the middle two when I put 55 in the next problem. That's all. 55. Express. Express two consecutive. Even numbers. Now, do you know how to represent a notion of an even number in the language of algebra? Even number, listen very carefully, even number in the language of algebra, that's it, we are done with all three of these problems 52, 53, and 54. We're going to get rid of them. You see, we cannot simply we cannot simply say uh, uh, this n here is an even number because we don't know what that n is. That's the whole point. The difference between algebra and arithmetic is that in arithmetic we deal with known quantities, solid concrete numbers. Algebra on the other hand is an abstract concept. We deal with abstract numbers, numbers that we cannot ascertain the value of. Unknown quantities that is. We do not know what n is. We have no idea what n represents here. So how can we so how can we be sure that n is an even number? We cannot simply say n is an even number. It's just an n, isn't it? Is that's an integer? N represents here an integer. That's what it is. N represents. N represents an integer. It could be two, in which case it is even. It could be three. It could be seven. It could be ten, in which case it is even. It could be one hundred and one. It could be 3002, in which case again it's even. It's some number. It could be, could be any number. N represents an integer. 
a positive integer or negative integer, it doesn't matter, it's an integer. But because of the fact that we do not know whether it's odd or even, whether it's 3 or 2, the only way, the only way we can represent a notion of an even quantity that we force this thing to turn out to be an even number is by multiplying it by 2. Now it does now, in this case, in, the, in this notation, when we represent it like this, 2 times n, now it, it makes no difference whether n turns out to be an odd number or an even number. Because even if n turns out to be an odd number, if n turns, uh, turns out to be 7, 7 times 2 is 14, it's an even quantity. If it turns out to be an even number to begin with, it doesn't matter, even times even is still even. So now, even if it's odd number or even number, this n here, this n quantity, whether it's odd or even, it doesn't matter. Because even times even is going to be even, and odd times even is going to be even. That's how you represent a notion of an even number in the, in the language of algebra. So that's the first one. We're being asked to express two consecutive ones. If they're consecutive, if you have two consecutive even numbers, let's say six, if it's six, the next one is going to be eight. If it's 100, the next one is going to be 102. They are, they are two consecutive even numbers. If they are two consecutive even numbers, then the next one is going to be two more than the one before. The next one is going to be two more than the one before. The one before was 2n, so the next one is going to be 2n plus 2. If they are asked to represent three consecutive even numbers, then the one after that is, would have been 2n plus 4. There you go, 2n plus 2, 2n plus 4. The story begins with 2n. How do you represent a notion of an odd number? An odd number, let's talk about that. An odd number in the language of algebra, an odd number in the language of algebra is represented as 2 times n, now there is your problem, we do not know what n is, n could be, n, n is just an integer, n is just a whole number, it's an integer, it could be even, it could be odd, so listen carefully, if n turns out to be odd, then 2 times 3 is going to be 6, if n turns out to be even, then 2 times 4 is 8, that's not going to do the job, we want to represent the notion of an odd number, how do we force, what do we have to do to this quantity, how do we force it to make sure that this is always an odd quantity? We do not know what it's going to be here, whether it's even or odd, it's always going to be even. So how do we make sure this is always odd? Oh, by simply adding 1 to it. By simply adding 1 to it. 2 times n will always be an even number. That's what we did. That's 2 times n is always going to be an even number. So if you want to represent the notion of an odd number, you simply take the quantity, that's unknown quantity, we do not know what that quantity is going to be, but we do know that it's always going to be even. Because regardless of whether n turns out to be odd or even, 2 times odd or 2 times even, it's always going to be even quantity. But if you add 1 to it at the end, if you add 1 to it, if you add 1 to this quantity, that will always be an odd quantity. You see? Now we have 6 plus 1, we have 8 plus 1, because we are adding 1 to this quantity. We are adding 1 to this quantity. 6 plus 1, 8 plus 1, 102 plus 1, it's always going to be an odd quantity. An odd, an odd number in the language of algebra is represented as 2n plus 1. So, let's express three consecutive odd quantity. Three consecutive odd quantity. The first one is going to be 2n plus 1. The one after that is going to be 2 more than this one, which is 1 plus 2 is going to be 3. And the one after that is going to be 2 more than 3, which is 5. So now we have represented three consecutive odd numbers. They are consecutive. Why? How do we know they are consecutive? We do know they are odd. How do we know they are consecutive? Because they differ by exactly two. Why now?